Good evening, everyone. My name is Colin Gardner. I'm a research associate here at the GST. Um, tonight marks the return of the Harvard Symposium on Architecture under the heading, All That Is Solid. The series continues the tradition of treating problems of importance for architectural culture, focusing on real problems that designers face as they design. These constitute a constellation of points on which we tend to get stuck. Burning questions such as the role of technology, organization, geometry, the interior, matter, and traditions. The series pairs, pale, sorry, the series pairs with a parallel effort with A plus T architectural publishers to produce a series of edited volumes on precisely these questions. Tonight's exchange considers the question of design techniques. An exciting group of presenters and respondents has been convened. Inyaki will begin by, with an introduction to the topic. Camillo Restrepo, Sharon Johnston and Mark Lee, Jeanette Kuo and Philippe Brom will expand on this inquiry and present examples chosen from their practice. Finally, Neil Leach and Carlos Murrow will intervene with responses calibrated to provoke and open discussion. In that spirit, in that, uh, spirit the audience is invited to participate through Twitter and on the live back channel, and you can find instructions on how to do that on the back of your programs. Um, I'd like to thank the symposium supporter, the Harvard Council for Green Buildings and Cities, and welcome you all to the Harvard Symposium on Architecture, All That Is Solid. We begin with Inyaki Abolis, who will set the stage for tonight's panel, Design Techniques. Thank you for being here. I had a presentation that I have taken out three pages, so it will be shorter. Uh, um, yeah, let, let, let me begin saying that it's no accident that the first of the symposia to be held by the GSD Department of Architecture in the coming years is to deal with design techniques. The D in GSD uh, has great significance in the culture of this institution insofar as it is indicative that in order to get to the core of a discipline such as architecture, it is healthy to conduct not only introspective uh, research, but also to encourage the limits to be expanded, to look further and encounter similar disciplines, dissolving generated um, conventions. Design is a term that undoubtedly encompasses many disciplines leading a pathway to towards a shared outwards. Both outward and inward moments are nevertheless necessary and complementary. The systoles and diastoles of a system which grants us certain vitality and enables us to plan for the future. Planning for the future involves, to a certain extent, pointing forward and with your finger no? and, and, and saying, we are going this way or that way, no? making the right decision, not only in terms of the profession agreeing, but also in terms of taking social and cultural reality into consideration, along with all its issues and aspirations, and expanding material culture through a new idea of beauty. No one of these is achieved either by looking outwards and pointing or by taking refuge in an unyielding disciplinary autonomy. Yet maybe we should start today with something a little more modest, much more modest, I would say, and necessary, and interrogate ourselves about what we are doing, what we are doing collectively, and how we are doing this right now and on once a time. Now, which design techniques really interest us? Which ones do we believe in? Why do their outcomes speak to us in the language of our times and say to us, we don't like this other thing any longer. We don't believe in this or that. Its time has come and gone. Don't call me to account. I am only doing what I believe I should be doing and hardly know how or why I'm doing it. How or why I'm doing this, what and who inspire us, we shall come back to this elusive world later. These are the main issues of this symposium, 
which aims to initiate an ambitious series of discussions, as, as Colin has pointed out, on highly relevant and paradoxically concealed topics which are avoided in a profession whose culture is often far too benevolent towards the mighty words of philosophy or science. And maybe I'm guilty because I have brought thermodynamics no, to the school, so, so I'm part of this. <laughs> uh, let me uh, say that many have wondered about creative processes and their extraordinary and difficult location in a corner of uh, psychologically obscure subjectivity which contends with petty practical matters and giant abstractions, constraints and in instinctive uh, gestures far removed from any subjugation. The everyday routines of professional practice and great theories on paradigm shifts with resources which do not answer to any of these conditions of which we are never fully aware at the most a posteriori and having held quasi-psychoanalytical interrogations, and which act like secret agent, agents of architecture as artistic practice, frequently based on issues so far removed from those issues objectively involved in the project that merely to mention them would be to greatly endanger the designer's credibility. And for this reason, they are the most profound manifestation of the artistic uh, nature of architecture compared to, for instance, uh, creation in science or engineering. This artistic condition <coughs> is calibrated either in terms of the frequency which, with which the design techniques actually employed by us architects are removed from any functionality. They respond in no way to the question posed nor are they based on any objective data the architects has been provided with. And on the other hand, they have a significant dose of whimsical, perverse, childish play about them. Not so much as they're going against the grain more, they're avoiding the expected, as only the new or expected could release, bring out the artistic condition. The as I desire with which Cervantes proudly ended his last sentence in Don Quixote, the shortest and most profound design technique manifesto ever written, as I desire. The great text by Ray Raymond Roussel, how I wrote certain of my books, such as Locus Solus and others, is an essential reference in this, in this uh, symposium of tonight. No? It is a, a title which could be transferred directly to the symposium, how I designed certain of my projects and which emphasizes self-imposed and certainly irrational constraints. Roussel, for example, enforces a certain symmetry on the first and the final, I mean, you know, many of you know, no? the final and the, uh, the first and the final words, almost turning his works, his literature, into a gigantic uh, palindrome, setting out the words of the start and the ending in a highly random fashion, along with many other evidently arbitrary techniques. However, uh, beyond its specific playful data is randomness, this is a book written by a writer on creation, and as such, he speaks to us in an extremely surprising language in which nothing is as we should think or as could be thought from outside the creative moment. By performing a coldly descriptive quasi a uh, forensic exercise on what seemed to be extremely useless, unthinkable techniques, Raymond Roussel has made an extraordinary contribution which has helped and still helps many, many of us to understand that they are not alone, we are not alone in their quasi-obscure practices in which the arbitrary, the obsessive, the meticulous and particular, the private play on a world is not so much a decision as a necessity which furthermore, paradoxically, is not necessarily at odds with functionality, efficiency, and economy, common demands in our profession, and in fact is surprisingly useful for such ends. These reflections, despite their embryonic state, are what drove us, uh, and I, when I say us, I am involving many others like Mariana Ibáñez, Guillermo, uh, uh, Ali Malkawi, and many others that we haven't mentioned, like Bla uh, Santel, uh, that have been helping us in organizing this. Um, uh, these reflections, despite their embryonic, uh, embryonic state, are what drove us to swiftly write the summary which heads this symposium. At a moment of dissolution in design te uh, techniques is all an architect can grasp. 
Techniques occupy a beautifully indeterminate void on the fault line between theory and practice. A spur of reductive elegancy to either design techniques are uniquely powerful. A technique may disrupt, innovate, communicate, or surprise. At the same time, techniques stand as silent markers of memberships, opaque envelopes delimiting communities of colleagues. This first of two symposia, because we will have a second part, interrogates the motivations, or pretends to interrogate, the motivations, instruments, influences, justifications, effects, and origins of contemporary design techniques. Ultimately, technique is how novelty manifests itself in architecture, expanding and advancing the inner core of our discipline. That's all. I mean, we will begin now with the panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Iñaki, very much for this kind invitation. It's been wonderful to be able to be here and exchange some ideas and learn a lot. Thank you, Colin, also for all the help and putting this together. <clears throat> to design is to, to, take, to make things possible as built matter. To design is to take decisions and not be afraid of its outcome, because I think that to design, it's an optimistic activity, an optimistic action. And to design is to translate society into space. Uh, architecture works as an intersection that for us it's like the incomes come, the inputs, the inputs come as architecture, it can be modified, but the outcome always is related into architecture code. Also, the input can become a politic, uh, policy or other kind of uh, input, but then we are certainly believe that all of, all of, the, all of these uh, situations need to be coded as architecture. Uh, we, we understand that each project has a logic, each project has a certain way of rolling a bunch of ideas, as if we were doing sushi in a way, that for each one of these projects, a certain amount of ideas make a set, but then you learn from it, and then you change uh, these inputs and outputs, but then again, as I mentioned before, it's always set it as in architecture code. <clears throat> the, the, the idea of... Um, of, of designing, I think it's mainly to test and experiment by using memories, by drawing, to observe, by discussing, exchange, by writing, and all these elements here have a strong relation between them that makes us like a complete architect. That one that it's able to read, write, teach, research, discuss, and draw. Uh, I think these elements create a very interesting relation that we call the ghost file, which is a file that is composed of many elements that I will go through as memories, experiences, books, uh, conversations and so on, that it's enabled to become architecture when you're able to risk, to risk all this information and make it become something tangible. Uh, some of the memories that I have, uh, it's mainly when we were, uh, when I was a child going to catch some butterflies with my parents in the um, region of Colombia. So from that experience, uh, I recall two things that were very important that has been always on my mind, like let's say like this lost object. The first one is the idea of, um, oh, sorry, the forest. The forest as this is a space that has no boundaries, there is no inside, no outside, very intermediate in between, undefined in a way. And then geography, and geography understood as this section, as this way of relating what's above, what's below, how these relations take place in an oblique manner. But also geology understood as this multi-layering of understanding history as a process that takes place that sometimes we don't see. And that also becomes this kind of multi-layering of materials and very rough, concrete matter. At the same time, we deal with some constraints. This has been, let's say, the history and the way Colombia has behaved through the last 50 years. Pretty much we are a little bit more active lately. That has given us a very tough uh, way of understanding materials and mainly constraints. We don't have much more contact with the outside world because, because of violence and all that uh, struggling we had had. Uh, this is Medellin, where I work. It's very marked by geography, so this idea of relation of who's above, who's below, what's, what's being seen, who's being saw, 
from the top it makes a lot of sense. Also dealing with these different uh, social uh, inputs of income that makes an architecture an interesting tool for a political transformation that we have experienced. So we also we have no architecture scene, which means that we have no galleries exhibiting architecture, no grants for architecture, no exhibition in museums, no magazines, no Venice Biennale, no World Fair participation. So the way we contrast our information is through public competitions, there are a lot, which is a very interesting tool, and at the same time how we, how we have conversations and exchange with other friends. This ghost uh, file gets also enriched with the things that we read, with the things that we read. Some of those authors, of course, are contradictory if you place them in a very critical way. But I think that the interesting thing about the ghost file is that you are able to digest all that information and create a new perspective, a new frame to understand the world from that point of view. How you contrast the information to make it become projects and to make it become a position toward the world. This is the office. Uh, I have um, five people that work with me. Some of them have been with me for seven years now. And the way we do the projects is very simple in a way. The, the layout, the general layout, is that we discuss some of the ideas that most of them come out from this ghost file that, that I, I don't know ho however it, it, it might be called another way. Then these ideas are pretty much related to a strategy, how we will do, we'll, 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 we will take the risks and how we will do it. Then most of the times I draw the first ideas in a floor plan in AutoCAD 2D. And then this uh, floor plan begins to have some sections also in 2D. And then these drawings begin to rotate among very different uh, desks in the office. Somebody takes the section, somebody takes the floor plan, then it gets back to me, I redraw something there. So we begin to, to dialogue through the drawing. We don't use Rhino as a way of thinking, we use Rhino as a way of representation. We do it to understand or to kind of uh, detect some things that we still don't understand when we try to overlay all these layers. So it's pretty much going back and forth with um, sketching in a notebook, very simple ideas, mostly diagrams, but then most of the thinking through design gets done in AutoCAD. This is a list of the projects that we have done so far. Uh, many of them are competitions, and many of them are private commissions, but I will refer mainly to some of the ones that are with a bigger character, which is the ones that I think they create a breakthrough or have changed our way of perceiving or doing stuff. Um, this is also how the books are permeating in time. I think everything began with Delirious New York. I think uh, that made us aware of many issues that were going on in the city, and then, of course, by complementing that with the view by Richard Sennett of Flesh and Stone, then it began to create a, a very certain understanding of the body, and especially when we moved to Richard Ser, uh, to Michel Serre uh, about the five senses, which is this idea of the surface that gets invaginated, which is that the same surface is able to provide you with different conditions. It depends how it's administrated. And of course, you can go through many of all these books and references. Something that it's, uh, that it's quite interesting is that how late I arrived to Aldo Rossi, for example. So we have learned a lot from many different projects. Uh, from housing, we have, love, le we have learned about the availability and potential of a floor plan. Houses, uh, we learn uh, how are they small labs for testing ideas, uh, exhibitions or small projects to be resourceful, public buildings and parks about transformation, and competitions about experiments and take risk. This is a floor plan of a project we did in 2004. It was a housing project where we learned that if we were able to bring and amplify the landscape down that was some trunks of the trees, then we will have a material relation with, um, with, with the building and how we were opening the system for everybody that was born there to choose where to place the windows. Then we thought that we could took that more radical and then we created this other project that is called 5G Street, where we designed a lot of different typologies from 80 square meters to 120. So we were creating these typologies, or people was all also uh, possible to buy um, an apartment there and do whatever they wanted. So this is what we were getting back, all these kind of uh, layouts that people were hiring with other architects, and this is somehow the outcome. So you will have a studio, an office, an apartment for a 60-year-old uh, woman, uh, young people, etc. This is how it looks like, because people could also put place the balcony or the window wherever they wanted according to the layout. But also we were trying to give some more uh, rigid and let's say more structure to the main facade, making these main spaces more 
more reliable, these spaces that most of the times are the dark spaces, the staircase, and so on. From these houses, it's about little experiments. Uh, mainly at the beginning, it was about materials and layouts, how geometry was able to resist and support many different conditions about a family stretching or, or expanding, having kids or kids leaving the house. So we were mainly doing all these uh, experiments with these rocks and stone, and also about involving all this geography about for the roofs and the sections. Also, uh, learning from the construction sites, and also learning something as that as that geography delimited, the they were creating this surface as how geo geometry and the floor plan became this layout for relations, how to expand as a membrane to increase the amount of um, exchange with the exterior and what is surrounded. Also in 2005, we won this competition, the Orchid House, that it's interesting because we were thinking that geometry could hold all these necessities. Uh, we created this model that was called uh, urban, um, flower tree that, held, that had many conditions. It was a steel structure covered with pine tree. And then we created this canopy that created this uh, idea of space, intermediate space, of how air was going through. But it was mainly like, like expanding this idea of the forest that was somehow in my memory. It became a public space, so you have many different activities there. Then we thought in a wrong sense, which was, I think, a mistake, that a geometry could hold for everything and could respond for everything. So then I step, on, I step out of that idea of trusting geometry in such a, a strange way. So I got rid of the uh, one geometry that covers all. I, I don't believe that works anymore. So then we, we got this commission to do a very brief exhibition for, um, for, for, for a meeting, in, for a political meeting in Colombia, in Medellin. And we were thinking that the, it should be a pavilion like that, but the pavilion was impossible because they only have, we only had five days to build, to build it. And then we could not perforate on the floor because uh, it's, the, it's the, um, the roof of the convention center. But the fact was that the wind was so hard that it was gonna be taken by the wind. So, we, so I went to, the, um, to the, um, mm. this kind of home center where supplies are sold. This project is in association with uh, Luis Calleja's former office, Paisajes Emergentes. And um, we were thinking about how to make these water tanks of 10,000 liters, make it become like a ready-made architecture. We were thinking, of course, of Instagram, you know, of, um, sorry, Archigram. So <laughs> now what happens? Yeah. So we were thinking about Archigram pretty much, um, how these ready-made pop-up things that could appear. So we were buying these 10,000 10, liter tanks uh, covering it with a lot of information they required and making all these capsules to perform as uh, little pavilions that will show something about the city. At night they were changing by different lights and different conditions that were being played inside of each one of them. So then I found that there was a frame that I needed and I realized that uh, the forms of transition has been a topic that it's been through my work, which is this layering, this way of, um, of the built forms that emerge under extreme geographical, social, and environmental condition, it has indeterminate borders and temporary but intense use. So I think uh -huh. I've been working with this idea for the last uh, years, something that I discovered after doing and thinking and reading, looking retrospectively. And the last project I'm gonna show you, it's uh, an innovation center made um, that, that they asked us, Argo, Argos is a cement company, they wanted an innovation center. So I thought that innovation most of the times is related with the digital, but I thought that innovation should be related with something that is completely the opposite. Something that is there with history, that has to do with history. So we went to the, um, to the quarry there of, uh, of Argos, and then I realized that the project was already here. What happened if we were able to create the building, that, like the building will express the, produ the production of concrete and cement. How will the building will be able to tell a story and at the same time be related with architecture history? So what we created was a multi-layer building uh, where we were processing the stone uh, that gives origin to a cement in different ways, different sizes. So on the first floor, we were thinking about a technique, pretty much about stacking rocks, the, pretty much Stonehenge. The second was very much about Cusco, how to have these big rocks. The third one was more like Pompeii. The fourth was like Islamic architecture that lets air go by. And the fifth, a kind of a translucent concrete. Each one of these elements were related in a way we needed to put a space that, 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 that were related with the, with the things that were going on inside. So for example, in this one, it was all the laboratories where all the mix of cement was going on. So the air could go through. These ones, they had less light to be available inside. 
So it had this um, w place where they were analyzing like an X-ray digital uh, computer-aided images. So we, we created all this stacking. The project was pretty much like this. And um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. forward with this? Uh, we're based in Los Angeles, so it also is a very impoverished architectural culture. And we, we don't even have public architectural competition, so I think it's better off in, in Medellin. Uh, the, the, the design technique we'd like to, uh, to share with you today that's close to our heart is, is the technique of approximation, of uh, one thing trying to become something else but never becomes it. Uh, but to start, we'd like to start off with uh, examples that are outside of architecture. Um, uh, these are images of the work of the fashion photographer, uh, Peter Augustin, who is renowned for photographing hair. And uh, we spoke with him, and he told us one of his secret techniques is that when uh, the model comes into his studio with the hair all done up, he would ask her to hop on a stationary point, just continuously hopping. And basically what he does is he, he will employ a, a very fast shutter and try to capture the photograph when she's at the peak of the jump. So, so at the end, it, what, what, what happens is that it, it creates some volume in her hair. So the shape is created both by the hair stylists who style the hair and this volume that created from this hopping. Uh, oftentimes in his photographs, you actually don't see the, move, the movement or the motion. They look like they're standing still. Some are more obvious. But there's a very secret technique of just this hopping that creates this very, very slight lift. Uh, furthermore, there's a sub-technique to that is that he, uh, sometimes he said models come in, they're very uh, insecure, they're very young, very uncomfortable. When you ask them to hop, and they they're very, even feel very strange about it. But as they hop, it increases their heartbeat. So then they get more relaxed, and they get feel a little bit sexy, and they get into character. You know, it's a, it's a it's a two-way street. Uh, the, the, the second example is, uh, is the work of uh, Kristen Burke, a costume designer, uh, uh, mostly in movies. Um, these are stills from the movie The Cooler uh, about 10 years ago that starred William H. Macy. Those of you that saw the movie might remember the, the plot line or the character of William Macy. Is, uh, he started off as, uh, as a, a bit of a loser. And then uh, as the movie develops, his character develops, and then he gained confidence, he got the girl, and he uh, uh, rode off in the sunset at the end. Uh, what Kristen Burke did for the movie is that she designed seven suits for William Macy, seven identical suits, but the seven suits are different sizes and different fits. So in the beginning of the movie, like in the upper left-hand corner, the, suits, the suit that William Macy was wearing was too big. He said at one point he felt like he was swimming in a suit and ill-fitted. But over the course of the movie, as his, his character develops, the suits become better fit, but very subtly. So one couldn't tell. But at the end, you know, if you compare the first frame and the last frame, the suit were re re really well uh, tailored. Um, and then the third is uh, what we've been obsessed with is the work of uh, uh, John Baldassari. In the 70s, he did a series of photographs that are titled uh, Throwing Four Balls into the Air to Achieve a Square, or Throwing Three Balls into the Air to Achieve a rectangle, uh, Triangle, or Throwing Three Balls in the Air to Achieve a Straight Line. And, and oftentimes, they're the best of uh, 36 tries, because uh, 36 was the number of uh, frames in a 35 millimeter uh, film row. And, and, and for us, it's, uh, uh, I think all these techniques are interesting to us because for us, maybe it's a way, uh, as a lens to understand how we uh, employ or deploy the, the technique of approximation in architecture itself. In the sense that maybe the photographer, the, the technique of hopping, has to do with something that's very inexact. You know, it, has, uh, it tries to unlock the, the mysteries of, of gravity and movement. Or the way that uh, Kristen Burke used tailoring to 
approximate the silhouette of the character. Or the way that John Baldessari uh, deployed a, a, a soft geometric framework late in the process to review somehow new and unexpected forms and shapes. And w as architects, I, I think we, we, we approximate. And what we approximate the most was, was type. Uh, a type for us is something that is rooted into the core, within the core of the discipline. It has a thousand years of, uh, years of intelligence built into type. Uh, but when we start off with a project, we never start off with type itself. We start off with very generic type of organization. We organize the project very methodically. And, and, and sometimes in the middle of the design process, and sometimes even late in the design process, we begin to realize that the building begin to take on a certain similarities with either one type or multiple types. And then we begin to look into type itself. So we, don't start, we didn't start off with type as an a priori, but halfway or even at the late in the process, type becomes something that informs our project. We begin to look into the history of that type. So in the way that the project themselves never become that type itself, but because it started off with something that is sometimes far away from it. And uh, uh, we, we tend to deploy this technique where we try to create almost a photogram of the project at that moment when it begins to approximate a type. Sometimes a very bare silhouette, just enough to see the gestalt and somehow distill the information again and, and, and proceed from there. Um, you might ask, like, why would we be interested in, in, in approximation of type? And I think for us, it basically helps uh, reconcile a gap between specificity and, and, and uh, generality. Uh, we think our view of history is that uh, maybe there's a certain internationalism in early 20th, 20th century that evolved into a globalism of what we have today, that, that a certain spe spe uh, specific genera generality took, took form, a kind of focus on iconic buildings, but oftentimes there's not much beyond the icon itself. And, and we think that's maybe the, the, it's the international style that assumed a certain generic form or to homogenize the local context 100 years ago, that, that today this global architecture launched a counter movement that uh, the privilege of a certain highly specific form of architecture that, that begins to invigorate or maybe colonize the, gen the old generality of this homogenized context. But what we would prefer is this kind of a generic specificity because we think architecture today needs a more bottom-up strategy of integration rather than a, a top-down approach of uh, subordination. And, and, and in many ways, I think for us, uh, typology is a cloak to cloak complexity that brings back this type of genericness in architecture. So I wanted to... Um talk a little bit about, and maybe in more specific detail, a couple ways that we employ this, this technique of approximation. And I think if we understand approximation to be somewhat like a mirroring of some idealized condition, but not exactly replicating it, that we, it challenges us to look beyond um, maybe typical organizational models, even of this notion of literally starting with type, and look at what we have come to understand, a kind of more dynamic distribution of design resources and architecture. And for us, this dynamic distribution can be understood in, in one lens as really a kind of design economy, and in a very literal way about how do we allocate resources of design and even dollars into, into our work. A lot of times when, when one starts a project or starts dealing with um, builders and costs, someone will say, oh, this, this looks like a project that would be $500 a square foot, and they understand that in a very kind of generic and even way that would describe the entire landscape of the building according to one metric. And we find that that results often in very, um, kind of a kind of architecture that even before you see it, if you know it's $500 a square foot, you can imagine certain kinds of qualities, kinds of windows, kinds of hardware, certain quantities, sizes of windows, types of structures, and even conditions of the atmosphere of the building. And we find that if we want to move beyond simply building, but sort of elevate into architecture, that we need to think about how we can implement this dynamic model of um, distribution of architecture and and kind of intensity of design in a different way. So we, we think about a more relative model where, for example, you might take 20% of the building and invest 
a kind of exceptional budget, something like $1,500 a square foot, let's say, and the remaining 80% of the building might be a more typical budget of $400, for example. And I think we understand that this isn't something new, um, but that it's, it's you know, you, you can imagine builders all over the world that are building luxury buildings, and they, you, the, the problem is that typically you, you know where those resources have been allocated, so the lobby looks great and the rest of the building is, is relatively banal. So for us, it's the secret, the, the real secret that is, is what embodies the secret of approximation is actually figuring out how to make the most expensive, the most exceptional parts of the building the most invisible. And the project is then really about seamlessly integrating that exceptional condition in a way that's almost invisibly perceptible at first glance. And that the kind of process of integration is what elevates the entire structure. It makes it apparently exceptional. And um, I think the key part, the key aspect of that, is it never really reveals itself at exactly where resources are allocated. And so, just like Kristen, um, Kristen Burke dealing with the suit, the kind of fitting slowly is transformed, and before you know it, you've gone from a sort of oversized, awkward um, character to something that's someone that's powerful and defined and articulate. So I think if we um, extend this idea of approximation and design economy, we can also talk a little bit more about the idea of approximation as it informs type in our work. I think as Mark said, we're, we're not, we typically don't start a project with a very, with a singular model, of, whether it's a heuristic model of some image or, um, or a singular type, like a courtyard type. But we, we, we actually, we, we begin with a series of specific conditions relative to a project, whether it has to do with structure, something about the envelope, um, a material condition, and we began to sort of synthesize those through the design process. And the goal is, is never to um, really create a kind of seamless whole, but, but somehow begin to find coherence that begins to approximate a type. So very different than starting from a type and moving away from it through transformations and, and breaking down of, of, the, of the typological order but sort of building towards something. And I think underlying that, um, that aspiration is an interest that we have in the kind of spatial resolution of our work, which is to think of it almost as a, as a kind of suspended state, that it's um, in a way on its way to becoming something, but it's never totally resolved um, through the architecture. And maybe a, an example that is, is um, to just to, to kind of name a few conditions would be, for example, the vault house. This is this image here. And there were many, many sort of constraints that were brought from outside of the project to do with the zoning envelope, the conditions of the rooms, the sort of integer of the vault, the introduction of a void that was necessary for light, and the requirement to lift the building off the ground in response to the tsunami conditions of this particular site. So for us, the, the, the process is not about um, seamlessly um, smoothening out all the, the kind of variable conditions that are a result of these layers of the project, but actually focusing more on the kind of moments of contrast, the moments of kind of misfit where, they, where, the, where elements of the building come together and in, in, a, in a way, almost in an unresolved way. And that becomes an area of a, of a lot of in, intense architectural investigation in the work. So I think um, maybe just to summarize, it's, it's the idea of kind of a, this bottom-up integration of conditions that we find relevant and interesting in architecture as opposed to a kind of top-down approach of kind of subjugation of conditions into something singular and whole. And I, for us, this, this technique of approximation is a, is, a, is a kind of valuable vehicle to get us, um, to get us there. So thank you. We'd like to donate our surplus time to uh, Jeanette. <laughs> so um, since everybody sort of started off also by positioning themselves from where they came from, actually, uh, for, for me, um, the, the fact that I'm, my practice is in, in Zurich these days is actually a huge influence in terms of what we've been doing um, in the last five years. In fact, my partner and I moved to, 
to Zurich to set up our practice. We were here in the US and in New York for quite some time before. And, um, and that decision, in fact, uh, led us also to, to question in some ways quite fundamentally what we do and, and how we think about it. Um, actually, I just realized I don't know how to advance the slides here. Uh, is this, this one? Oh, there. Great, there were arrows. Um, is that not, it's not advancing. Um, well, I'll keep going anyways. Um, the, um, one of the things, in fact, that, that brought us to Zurich from the, from the get-go is to wanting to, to actually engage in the practice um, to build and to think about architecture as a constructive discipline. It's a wonderful image. You just have to wait for it. Makes this makes it better when you have a bit of suspense. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, f for us, um, the, um, the, the idea also of constructing or of, 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 of engaging in a practice on a very sort of, let's say, um, a head-on um, uh, point of view also led us to thinking about, you know, what where we would actually like to put our focus and, and, and what for us was actually at stake uh, within uh, the architectural discipline from our point of view. And for us, that has actually been to, to think about architecture and to think about space from the inside out. Um, what that means is that, not, not to say that we're not interested in, in uh, buildings as objects or buildings uh, from, from you know, how, how it looks, uh, but really to question fundamentally how we um, how, how we design or how we think about space. And, um, you know, part of that obviously is um, understanding a kind of certain premise of, of typology, of understanding um, constraints that are embedded within the discipline um, and, and how to navigate uh, within this realm. This image is actually from the Grand Hall of the Natural History Museum in Paris. One of my, in fact, one of my favorite spaces in Paris. And the animals across time and across species are actually arranged in order of size, um, in this kind of monochromatic, matter of fact way. And, you know, as, as an opposition, let's say, to um, what is done in the Natural History Museum in New York, where, where the animals are displayed in, in vitrines uh, within the kind of, uh, uh, let's say, artificial context that they've been given, this le allows us to actually view them and to compare them and to actually understand, let's say, performance um, and, and similarities across types. It allows us to understand, in some ways, that uh, typologies are not absolute. Uh, context is implicit, but also not absolute. And that, um, in some ways, it challenges us also to think about the kind of boundaries of, of classification. So for, for us, um, a lot of what we've been uh, dealing with, let's say, in our own practice, and I'll be showing, um, in fact, two, um, two projects, two recent projects, uh, competitions that we did, one that we won and one that we lost, as a way also of, of um, of showing in a way the, the um, methodology that we use and the way that we design. Um, but a lot of it is to engage with these kind of bare bones, you know, the, the kind of elementary um, uh, components of architecture, um, the structure, the infrastructure, um, typology, and, uh, and to use that in a way to rethink architectural space. Uh, what does it mean to, how does it mean to design space and, and, and space that's actually inhabited? So the first project is uh, one that we won uh, just last year. Uh, we're currently in the last days of uh, design development for this project. Um, it's uh, an administrative and research building for the University of Lausanne um, that 
will house four user groups, so it's actually four different um, entities, associations, research um, institutes that are coming together that are, are essentially researching um, the um, science of sports. And so the, the program is um, essentially office, office spaces and labs, uh, as well as some uh, auditoriums. Uh, but what was quite specific about this program, because it was for different entities, was the demand for informal workspaces or, or spaces that added a kind of value to the, to the project that, um, uh, let's say, uh, gave it a, an opportunity for, for exchange between the four different groups. So if you consider, for example, an office building, or a very typical office building, um, there's uh, also, you know, uh, maybe just to foreground this a little bit, we had decided quite early on to have, um, to go with a, a quite compact form on the site. Um, and with a kind of compact office building, you end up with two very typical situations. Either um, a solid core in the middle uh, that occupies the kind of dark space, or uh, a kind of atrium, which is a void, and uh, which essentially you also could not use. We questioned these, these two basic types in a way um, to then rethink what that really means. So for us, actually, what was interesting was to, let's say, to, to divide the building into two parts that allowed it to perform the best in each way. So to accept, in a way, some of the things that were, um, let's say, quite um, uh, typical for an office space in terms of the depth of a uh, the depth of a, uh, a room or um, the, the kind of corridor that would distribute between it. So we left this kind of outer ring, um, in essence, to be as flexible and as, as, um, as, as repetitive in a way as, um, as possible in order to allow the interior um, this, uh, let's say, this, this kind of life of its own. Um, and the interior core, in a way, is a kind of dissolved inner core um, so you can imagine the building in two parts that are interdependent. One is a very sort of lightweight uh, structure of plates and columns that's then braced by this inner core, which is um, essentially all the kind of services uh, that are stacked and um, that are embedded within this, uh, this structure, but that also provides um, as a kind of extra value an interior landscape. So the, um, the, the different bars that are stacked within here essentially uh, contain the labs, the spaces that actually don't need light, um, and, um, and together with the, the uh, vertical cores of the building that distribute the, the um, circulation and things like that, then brace the entire building structurally, um, but they also provide the kind of uh, infrastructure of this space. But what is... In essence, the, the kind of, um, let's say, added value to it was the, this, this um, space of exchange that was created as a, as a landscape within it. Um, oops, this, is, this slide was not supposed to be here. <laughs> Strange. <laughs> that crept up really out of nowhere. That was from a very different lecture. Um, but uh, in any case, there's a, there's a um, this is the, the ghost file of... Uh, <laughs> Camilo coming in. Um, but uh, there's essentially these, these terraces that allow for the, the exchange between the four different entities as, I, as well as views, uh, transparencies through to the office uh, spaces um, that allow these two worlds, in, in fact, to, um, uh, to interrelate. That keeps coming back. It's very strange. <laughs> um, and, um, but what, what for us was quite... Um, surprising in a way was that by, by essentially splitting the, two, the, the kind of building into two parts, one which is this kind of hyper-functional uh, office ring um, where we really accepted the, the, the basic, let's say, premises of, of the typology of even the kind of, you know, 120, 1 meter 25 uh, window bays and the, the, the kind of flexibility of the partitions that would be allowed within that system, the depth of the 5 meters that allows for optimum daylighting and things like that. Um, that allowed for the coexistence of these 
these two worlds, um, one, the world of the, the kind of private, the, the, the intimate, and the other one, the, the world of the exchange and the, uh, the unpredictable. Um, but maybe just to bring it back a little bit also to, to the kind of process of that, um, it was not really so straightforward either. I mean, for, for us, it was, it's always a little bit of a survival of the fittest. We, we try actually many, many different things that um, in, only in the end to kind of rule out uh, the ones that actually don't work. Um, and, and from that, obviously, there's a lot of different criteria um, uh, and, and, and um, uh, let's say, constraints that go into understanding um, what that would be. Um, one, for example, that, that was very, very simple that we ignored for a long time, but in essence was, was the, the, the easiest or the, let's say the, the one that kind of cracked the problem for us was the placement of the vertical cores. Um, for a long time, we were, we were resisting having them to be symmetrical. Uh, we were resisting them to be kind of uh, centered uh, within the plan. Um, and, uh, but, but it was really the, the moment where we, we, we actually tried that out that it liberated us and, and uh, secured the kind of uh, decision of it. Um, so that in the end, it, in fact, it was maybe uh, let's say the second from second row, first one on the second row that was most like, I guess, what we ended up with in the end, which in fact was the simplest uh, out of all of these that we had tried. Um, the second project is a housing project that we did, in fact, that was that we started when we were still in the U.S. and we were in the process of moving. Um, uh, to, to Zurich. Uh, we didn't win this, but for us it was, it was one of the things that um, also led us to understanding a little bit more the, the, the let's say, the Swiss competition culture and um, to um, also the, the, let's say, the, the kind of constraints that were perhaps within it, and in, in some ways to also embrace that. Um, so the um, image here is a still shot that's extracted from a short digital film that's made by Sergei Hein, uh, I believe he's an artist, that's a parody of the Berlin Plattenbau, uh, rethought here as a, as a Tetris game to inject some variety into an otherwise relentless repetition. We like the video because it embodies one of the central dilemmas that we face in housing. Uh, collective housing is a typology of contradictions while uh, building codes, environmental concerns, and market forces demand repetition and sameness at the scale of the overall building, individual lifestyles demand diversity on the scale of the unit. So we asked, what if this contradiction can instead become a synergy? If we see, housing is often guided by an economic logic that demands a certain amount of flexibility and yet retains um, a kind of clear system, which is why behind most of these uh, facades you would see a structure that's more often than not defined by the maison domino. Um, and you know, for us what was, what was maybe a little bit questionable about this was that if the regular spacing of the column, uh, of the columns allow complete freedom and plan, why couldn't the section also be liberated from the repetition to produce spatial differentiation? We discovered um, that Swiss building code allows for a 90 centimeter sectional drop uh, without having to install guardrails. And uh, we took advantage of this loophole to generate a continuous and undulating living landscape that could then be freely configured and reconfigured in the future. The shifts would register on the floor of some apartments, on the ceilings of others, to create spatial diversity. And this freedom was then offset in a way by the rigor that, that we introduced into the plan. Um, so in essence, we, we, were, we had to accept in some ways an economy uh, or an economical, um, uh, let's say, solution to this as well. Um, that the, the entire building was not just a kind of free-for-all, but that there was a kind of guiding logic to it. Um, and that the, that the building would be structured, in essence, through a kind of regular base system, quite uh, standardized structure, alternating by shafts and cores, um, and creating very efficient vertical alignments, despite the kind of freedom that we introduced uh, in the floor plates. So at first glance, the plans appear strict and relentless. 
but on closer inspection, they display a great variety of apartment types and, and spatial differentiations. Um, as part of the, the program of the competition, we were asked to actually, uh, in essence, um, design a prototype that would allow for uh, apartments from, from one-room apartments to 10-room sort of co-housing uh, shared apartments, uh, which is quite unusual as a, as a program typology in a way. Um, so, it, in fact, that was in some ways what generated also this, this search. I think the problem is advancing again. Oh, there it goes. Um, and part of that complexity in a way, and we, we, we work a lot actually with physical models. Um, I'm, I'm actually very, very curious also to discuss with Camilo later on in terms of his process because um, for, for us we work a lot um, uh, physically uh, in three dimensions before going into plan and a lot of it has to do also with uh, sometimes quite basic um, elementary forms but just understanding the, the kind of relationships three dimensionally. And um, to, to introduce a kind of systematic also into this and to also, let's say, address the, um, the requirement for, for a 30%, um, uh, let's say, uh, um, handicap accessible housing, we developed a, a sort of alphabet that was based on three basic unit types, the shotgun, the diagonal, and the corner units. And this kind of three floor system therefore allowed us to, to to um, unleash a kind of controlled freedom that always returned to a flat floor after three, um, three stacks. So the system allowed each unit to have its own spatial character while still allowing for future configurations. Um, we also set sometimes some, some rules that we imposed on ourselves that each unit, for example, had, had exposure on two sides or, or to two facades. Um, and each one had to have a higher space um, that was gained through this, uh, this sectional shift. And we were actually, you know, in some ways quite, quite surprised or also quite, uh, quite um, pleasantly surprised that even with all these rules that we were imposing that there was, there was quite a number of variety or quite a number of different uh, types that came out of it. So maybe just to wrap up is that um, perhaps what we're interested in, we're, we're interested in, in, um, in, in systems and in systematics of, of understanding buildings and understanding the kind of logics, let's say, of a building and designing from inside out. Um, but we're also interested in it as an open system, um, let's say as an infrastructure for different lifestyles and desires that invites inhabitants to, to appropriate the spaces or to, to, to use it um, in ways that we as designers cannot predict. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Inaki, for inviting me. Um, so I would like to present uh, a little the, the, my secret, secret of uh, design. Uh, the first, um, maybe the first part is uh, a ch to challenge um, the architectural element of, uh, and the architectural element of composition, and to say that uh, Maybe in the traditional architecture, the, the element of architecture are more the solid one. And uh, is it possible, because the, maybe the goal of architecture is more the, the, the space, so is it possible to, to change the solid element to, in, to invisible element and to go, go, uh, to go from wall to air to column to light or to floor and roof to heat and vapor? And so, and then after this, to change uh, also the the way to compose the, with this element, and to say that maybe we could uh, 
change from geometrical composition to more uh, meteorological composition and change symmetry to convection, addition to conduction or asymmetry to evaporation, for example. And this is uh, like um, catalog of uh, Guadet or the 19th century um, element of architecture or element of composition. Uh, and so we propose to move into uh, element of composition that are based on convection, conduction, or evaporation. So the, this is the first um, technique of uh, designing is to change the element of, uh, of the language of architecture and the element of composition of architecture. And then uh, the, the way to compose is uh, maybe uh, to move from uh, the contour line or the shape or the form into a more sfumato or gradation composition. And uh, if um, this is a middle age uh, painting, so you could see the contour line, you know, this, uh, the, the, there is a black line and then there is a color inside. So the shape, the form is based on the contour line and then there is something inside. And uh, it was also this uh, Manet, you know, the, the red, uh, trouser have this black line that are the contour line that define the shape of what is inside and what is outside. And of course, it's the comics books are based on this. And if you, there is this, this is this contour line tradition, this shape uh, tradition, and maybe there is another tradition, is a sfumato tradition. So this is a Leonardo da Vinci. So there is no contour line, you know, this is this technique to add a lot of layers of uh, painting that create, a, 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 there is no, no line, but it's only by overlapping all the different uh, uh, quantity of pigment inside each layer that start to dissolve, and there is no inside and outside, but everything is, is um, a kind of uh, smooth gradation from one color to another. And um, this is a photographer, Heinrich Kuhn, uh, one of, um, in the 19th century, and he do a lot of study. It was like, it's, it was um, photographical um, uh, study of gradation because he understand that in the, in the photography technique, you know, the, there is no contour line also be, between uh, the subject and the background. It's only a gradation of uh, light from uh, darker to the white, uh, more lighter, uh, um, um, uh, composition, so uh, um, it's on, only a question of density, uh, and um, and of course it was the same. Uh, I, I don't know why there is this one, but okay, but uh, okay. This is a uh, so this is a little this this idea in our project. This is a composition we use. Uh, so we try to define the space uh, with gradation and less uh, than. Uh, with contour line. So this is some image of uh, the section and the plan we are doing uh, in order to, to propose to define the one space and another without a straight limit, but to, uh, uh, to have uh, this uh, gradation between one situation to another one. This is a Taiwan uh, Taishung Park, and this is one part. And we have the, the way we, we have the element is a, is a, a gradation between something very cold to something very warm by adding different elements. And this is the, some other image. And this is a gradation also from very dense to less dense. This is a composition of the trees. And so um, another uh, uh, technique of composition is to say maybe we will not uh, compose by using a block or using the wall, but by starting by small element and to compose uh, the form by using small chemical element or small uh, um, 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 pointillisme elements of some uh, part of uh, uh, only part, uh, part and not to start with a wall. And uh, so this is a um, kind of uh, composition of the 19th uh, uh, century. And uh, 
the, um, this is an academic painting of the 19th century, so you could see that the, there is a wall composition and everything is together. And uh, it was challenged, this is this uh, Heinrich Kuhn photography, so here there is this, this uh, gradation uh, uh, between the, the background and, um, and the foreground. And then uh, with Claude Monet, it start to, the, 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 the shape and the form start to be dissolved in different fragments of light, different uh, points of light, and it becomes stronger here. There is no more contour line, it's only fragment of light that compose uh, the figure. And uh, it becomes very radical with uh, Seurat and the uh, pointillism uh, um, uh, post-impressionist, and they start to dissolve the shape into very small particle. And this is a little uh, same strategy we are using in our project is to um, to compose by element, not by doing the general shape, but by starting with small element and, uh, and to place the things uh, in order to compose uh, uh, the project. And for in the, in the Taiwan park, it's exactly like this. So all the compositions, the master plan start from small element, and so it's become more dense or less dense. And this is uh, the trees. And this is all the climatic uh, devices. So we are working on, on one element, and then we multiply this element uh, to, in order to create the, the shape. And each element have a kind of, it's a little like in the uh, impressionist painting. So each element has one quality. Uh, so it's still with the light, with the heat, with the, with the wind. And it creates, by addition, a kind of general shape but, but is, that is made by different uh, elements. And I just want to show this. Uh, this it was a, uh, this, um, it's blow some cold air. It's what we call an anticyclone. I just want to show quickly some image. So all the, all the shape also come from, in reality, from the, from the engineer, the calculation of the quantity of air and the speed of air. And this is... This is the model that will compose, and then this is the construction of the first one. This is a ground, uh, the pipe that will blow the cold air and with, that will be cool on the ground. <coughs> and this is another element that's cooled by evaporation. So just quickly show this. And, uh, and the la uh, another uh, thing is, um, is um, graphic design. I think also we, we need, uh, if we challenge uh, the element of architecture, the element of composition, also we have to challenge the element of representation of, of design. This was a funny publication in Habitare last year. It was a kind of uh, register of all the type of, uh, of people that you could find in 3D or, and, uh, and of course it starts with uh, the Le Corbusier and also we try, it was like a, how to invent our own figure, or our own uh, people inside the perspective because okay, you, you need to, to, to play this human scale and so finally we find a solution uh, related with our uh, project and, and uh, and so this is this type of people that we use in our uh, representation in 3D, and sometimes also this more physiological representation. And also the code of color. Uh, uh, now we have a lot of projects based on, on cyan and magenta. 
and or uh, uh, that show the different gradation and and because uh, the Taiwan park is now under construction so I'm thinking how to do a photography of the park so I, I was imagining to do a kind of mix of real visible photo and uh, in the same time some uh, thermographic photo and to put together in order to have a, a new way of uh, doing the photo so I think we in, in my practi practice, I try to challenge each phase of the project to imagine how to, to do things. And this is a new book we just published uh, last week. And the last, uh, um, the last thing is, um, is something about the single issue uh, when I was a student, it was at the moment in between Mario Botta and uh, Herzog and de Meuron. I, was, I, st I studied in Lausanne and uh, in Zurich. And, uh, and this is the, the first project of Mario Botta. And it was like uh, he, he started he, he start to do a square house, and then he did a round house, a circle house, and then a rectangular house. And so it was like each... Uh, house was uh, focusing on one shape, on one geometrical shape, and then he finds solution uh, uh, with this. And uh, when Herzog de Meuron start also to do project, they, they did this stone house, and uh, after it was this concrete house, and after it was this wood house, so it, it was also to focus on one material. For Mayobota, it was like to focus on one uh, geometrical form, and for Herzog and de Meuron, it was to focus on one specific material. And so we tried to do the same, to focus on uh, this is based on evaporation, or this is based on the convection. So this is... Uh, okay. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so I was struck by, um, Jeanette mentioned everybody um, introduced themselves by saying where they're from. Um, I'm from a different country. They do things differently there. Um, by which I mean not that I'm from the UK, which is what my passport says. Actually, I come from the other Cambridge, um, um, which is kind of similar, actually. Cold winters, bookshops, and bad restaurants. Um, I was actually a student um, in Emmanuel College, Cambridge, which is where John Harvard was. Um, if you look at the John Harvard statue, it's clearly not John Harvard. Um, there's a plaque on the side that says Emmanuel College. And, but what that meant was that I was brought up, I was educated in Cambridge, surrounded by Harvard scholars and Harvard exchange students. Um, so it doesn't seem like I come from a different country. Meanwhile, I come here, and there's this kind of AA dis diaspora that I hear that Moisen's gathered around him. So I bump into Hanif in the Chow House, and I share an office with Spiele, with whom I was teaching back in the UK, and so on. Um, so no, what I mean by that is, is, is not that I come from the UK, but I come from a different country in the sense the last five years I've, um, I've been based in Los Angeles. Um, and I know it's a different country because... Um, last semester there was a, a study abroad program from the GSD that went to LA. So clearly as far as the GSD is concerned, LA is a different country. Um, and LA is an interesting place because I think the, the notion of the discipline of architecture is much more porous in the sense that we saw last week that um, uh, Greg was showing his work, he's designing yachts and we know he designed silver, silverware and teapots and whatever else. And next week... Um, Elena Manfredini comes here, and she, of course, designs outfits for Nike, for Anna Kornikova and, and Roger Federer and so on. Um, and in many ways, the kind of the impulses we get there um, are very different. Um, so the last studio I, I taught in USC was, um, we just used Kinect. We just used a Kinect device, which you probably know from Xbox. It can track the human skeleton, and you can use it in a very interesting way to think about architecture. And so, too, we have this kind of collaboration with the film school there and uh, 
a lot of the sort of techniques and ideas are from there. Um, so world building, design fictions, um, and so on. Um, last two weeks ago, I invited someone from MIT Media Lab, someone called Sputniko, who is kind of interesting because she's a design fiction person. She's like the Lady Gaga of MIT Media Lab. Super interesting. Um, so there's a kind of like, a, I come from a world in which it's very, very porous. Um, and one of the comments I had from my, my colleague in the film school um, back in USC, when she came to a conference once of architects and we had uh, Francois Roche, crazy Frenchman, and uh, Roland, uh, Roland Snooks and, and, and Mamor de Landre and so on and so on. And she came at this comment that um, architects are like idea vultures. They just steal things from outside. Um, and what struck me above all about all the presentations was that every single one of them referred to some outside source as a kind of source of inspiration. So I was struck that by Camillo in the first place, um, where, I mean, the person most cut off in some sense from the outside world in this kind of very hermetic culture, and yet the whole notion of what architecture was was very porous. There were, I was looking at the books, um, and there weren't so many books by architects in this list of books, but I noticed there was one by Homi Baba, and of course Homi Baba is a, is a professor here at, um, in Harvard, not a professor of, of architecture, but uh, one of my um, one of my students from Colombia um, did a PhD with me on Homi Baba, um, Felipe Hernandez, and he's going to be here next semester. So I was struck that even in in, um, in in a kind of relatively remote culture, there was a kind of porosity to the notion of what architecture was. Meanwhile, Sharon and Mark showed us um, a whole range of sources of inspiration um, from photographers to costume designers um, and so on, and. Uh, as though they also were inspired um, by this kind of these techniques of uh, of appropriation from outside. Um, um, Jeanette, meanwhile, um, uh, started off with a with a photograph of um, some animal skeletons from Natural History Museum, and again went on to talk about film and filmmakers, and, uh, and as though that was also um, uh, a source of inspiration. I mean, quite different in the way the architecture. Um, uh, to what Sharon and Mark had done, but at the same time inspired by drawing upon uh, influences from outside. Um, um, meanwhile, um, Philippe um, uh, uh, also was showing middle age, uh, mid middle, uh, in paintings from the Middle Ages, um, photography, Manet, Tintin. I like the Tintin one. Um, uh, <coughs> and he mentioned this sad notion that there is no inside and outside, which kind of, in a sense, gave me the sense of what what um, what our, my understanding maybe of architecture might be. In a sense, it, it is something that doesn't have a very clearly defined notion or boundary. It's continually drawing upon um, impulses from outside. Uh, and I'm no, um, I'm as guilty as anyone else. Um, uh, um, I spent much of my life drawing upon continental philosophy from the work of Derrida, Deleuze, Foucault, and so on. And more recently, um, uh, have been working on a lot of computational ideas in, in involving them. And in this, this last couple of years, I've been working for NASA on a project to design a, a robot um, for the Moon and Mars. And my last book, which came, which came out last week, was about space architecture. So it's, I mean, I'm, I'm guilty as anyone. But it struck me really, and I, I blame actually Alberti, the person I worked on in the very beginning of my career. And he was himself this kind of uomo universale who was not only an architect, but also an artist, a sculptor, someone who wrote about philosophy, about, about sociology and mathematics and all these different sort of disciplines. As though it was the very nature of what it is to be an architect, to be this kind of pluralist, who in some sense is working in one discipline, but drawing upon another. Um, so I, I, what I want to leave with you is a, is a kind of thought that right now we're in a moment in some senses partly because of technologies that the, the, the dis difference between the, our discipline and outside is breaking down in what Douglas Rushkoff has called this kind of renaissance moment as increasingly we're using devices and techniques from outside architecture. Um, uh, tools like Maya, which are frankly weren't designed for architects or indeed Katia and so on and so on, um, to produce what we do. Um, and I find it interesting, and maybe it's not intentional, but paradoxical in a way that uh, here I am in, I think, what is the greatest school of architecture in the world, um, and, and yet it doesn't call itself a school of architecture, it calls itself a, a, a school of design, um, which begins to suggest that that is the kind of terrain in which we operate, a kind of a more broad global terrain in which architecture is 
kind of has very porous boundaries to outside and in which architects operate as these idea vultures. So that's my contribution, Carlos. I <laughs> Okay, I, I promise I won't talk about Barcelona and my um, <laughs> and where I come from and so on and so forth. No, I actually uh, I very much enjoyed all the presentations, uh, but I felt a little bit um, cheated in in, the, in my expectations to some extent, and I wanted to express that um, that frustration in a sense. So I, I came with the greatest expectations to to really um, I mean I think the topic chosen for tonight is absolutely essential in terms of. Um, what we do here and what we train people here, what we do pedagogically here. Um, and um, it could be simply stated probably in the most basic way as how we make decisions as designers. And I was hoping that these guys were going to unveil some of that and there was very little unveiled. And I'm, I really wonder why. I mean, actually, they, they all gave wonderful presentations. I think the issue of porosity is very present. Um, there's something that has to do with this shifting boundaries um, moving boundaries about things. Camilo used the notion of um, forms of transition, which speaks of this movement of these uh, what, um, shifting <coughs> boundaries. Uh, uh, Mark and Sharon uh, talked about approximation, which I think it's, it's something very, very fascinating the way they described it, but also um, speaks about something which is difficult to capture and um, in, in a shifting condition. Uh, Philippe talked about gradation, so this, all of these things. And probably when we got closer to that is when, in different ways, almost everyone mentioned the notion of constraints, and particularly then Jeanette dealt a lot of that with, uh, and, and passing from constraints, and I would say both self-imposed and um, external in a sense, to the notion of freedom. And uh, I think that's a key issue in a sense, where you talked about control freedom, and um, I would like to, well, probably, I don't know what, what our role is now, but I'd almost like to, to pose a couple of questions in a sense to, to, to everyone who was here. Um, one has to do with that. Um, probably the difference between, so I, I, one other reason why I felt a little bit cheated, actually, nicely cheated by, by, by people I really respect and I really enjoyed the, the, the work they showed, <coughs> is that um, it was not so much about how we make decisions as designers, but um, in the best of cases was a, a set of preferences that you showed, right? And uh, we all have preferences. Perhaps at some point, also Camilo mentioned this, these ghost files and whatever, which have to do with also another way of bringing back um, certain ideas. But um, I would like to, to really stress the, the, make a couple of questions, or ask a couple of questions to, to all of you. One has to do with this notion of freedom, and really, I think um, this control freedom that Jeanette was talking about has quite a lot to do with our craft, with our um, design specificity, which is different from strictly creative process. I mean, we were discussing with Iñaki that we're in a wonderful place because we have um, this um, treasury almost of the Norton lectures that have been happening at Harvard for um, almost a century now, I would say. And in, through those lectures, many people have uh, asked themselves, have reflected about the uh, creative process. We have had many musicians. We had uh, had um, several uh, poets and writers. Uh, uh, some painters, so people from the visual arts, very few architects, very few meaning very, very, very few. And uh, I wonder whether when we talk, when we try to think and um, try to make this transition between the individual and the collective through our creative process, it's something filtered by the very nature of architecture in a sense, which in the end has to navigate um, between this kind of notion of uh, reframing our own freedom and how we do that, but we didn't talk about that very much. And the other issue probably to, to, to kind of open up the conversation it's probably a fake question, but but um, I was thinking no, I'm, I every minute actually because of, precisely because of that I was rereading some of the Norton lectures uh, recently, and uh, lots of uh, writers talk about um, opening lines and how they begin a novel and whatever, which is actually not how you begin to design. I mean, some other guys, I mean, the Raymond Roussel talks a little bit about that, but I was wondering whether um, you could say something about how you how you begin or if whether that's I know I'm, I'm saying it's. It's a fake question because on my very position as a designer is we never begin anything, but we really jump into something which has already begun. But uh, if you could say something about how you begin to make decisions about specific projects, what is it that you take into account? Um, I'm talking about that out of personal curiosity and interest, and also because I think we have a duty in terms of the pedagogical nature of this institution to discuss those things, really. So anyone wants to start? or? 
<laughs> so if I may, if I may respond to the respondents, uh, yeah. both Carlos and and uh, oh, sir. Uh, both Carlos and Neil. I, I mean, I think uh, Carlos brought up the issue of open and close. I, 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 in a very simplistic distinction, I always believe that uh, thinkers are good. Thinkers are openers, but good architects are closers. So it's it's uh, it's two opposing uh, impulses when one did have to design. And, and and I also would like to uh, 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 percolate on, on what Neil brought up in terms of the uh, the opening and closing of the discipline. You know, I, I think we, I think it's very important for our generation to understand where we are now. You know, we've maybe talked for many years about opening up the discipline. What 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 what, what precisely does it mean now? Because because uh, uh, I, I believe that for us, you know. Uh, uh, the discipline is is not a jailhouse. Uh, the discipline is maybe Beaux Art it was, maybe different generation it was. But for us, the, the discipline, the core of the discipline is actually a key to a lot of richness. You know, so uh, certainly uh, when one had to wander outside of the discipline, one has to either do it out of the position of uh, uh, security. You have so much to give, you can give, or or you're lacking something that we need to latch on to other disciplines too. You know, and I think it's uh, it's it has to do with the vicissitudes of what techniques and means within the, the discipline itself. Um, I, I think the uh, the the uh, the poster of the lecture of uh, Jackson Pollock uh, dripping. I, I remember uh, Dave Hickey when he taught here. He recounted how important the picture of uh, Jackson Pollock being on the cover of Time magazine was because. For him, a young artist, it meant that everything that was outside the rules are now part of the rules. But he was horrified that 10 years later, when he became a teacher, he went to he went he saw the art teachers telling the students that you have to drip. If you don't drip, you have no soul. <laughs> you know, and so something that was used to open up something new became governing. You know, and I, I think it's important to think about history. What what does history mean to us now? You know, the history, the core of the discipline. Is it something binding? I don't think. I don't think it's binding for us anymore. So, to presume uh, re repression when there's not, nothing, not, none exists, I think it's a, 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 a type of self-aggrandizement, you know. But, but I think this is a, an important question, at least for, for I feel for our generation. Yeah. Can I say something about the poster? And I, I think the poster is, I mean, <laughs> took us a lot of time, and then Colin was uh, active part of this, and I, I think that. Uh, First of all, we were looking for architects in action, and they were not really sexy. I mean, they were like boring. Maybe the cigar of Miss Van der Rohe was the most interesting tool <laughs> that we could find. But uh, when we moved into uh, the uh, artistic scene, immediately we had, a, as has happened today, you know, I mean, most of, mostly all of you have had references that are not exactly from architecture, but you were using them as metaphors of, of architecture. No? So uh, when we saw this image of Jackson Pollock, we we knew that we had to have a kind of dual approach. I mean, it was like pom pom pom. Immediately, we we thought that this kind of super expressive su subjectivism should be balanced with the, the super cool heliodrome. Or I don't know how it is called. This this sphere of the. All GI brothers in the laboratory of Princeton simulating the sun path in a kind of super clean atmosphere, no? and and I think that uh, in a way we've seen something like this. No? If we compare Camillo's approach to stone, or, or we see, compare uh, to Philippe's uh, presentation, or to Jeanette Kuo that are like like much more like aseptic in a way in the, with gloves. Uh, I think that, that there is a kind of constant. Mm, Movement, or, or, or I mean, or yours. I mean, there is a constant movement from the the need of some kind of uh, objectivism and 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 the need of expression, that super subjective expression. And this is why, in the, my introduction, I was saying that uh, we are not allowed, in a way, to exp to explain the reasons of our projects to our clients, because if our clients really uh, we're knowing how do we design, and they would never contract us. I mean, because it's completely. I mean, it, it, they think that we study seriously the program, the budget, and all these things, and it's, it never happens like this. Never, never happens like this. So I think that this this kind of balance is is interesting. And the other thing I wanted to say, just to put on the table, is that I think that we can read in in, in between the lines of of all the presentations that there were some some. Uh, interesting aspects that uh, link, uh, in a way, I think the most interesting thing is the, the resistance to 
objective parameters, I would say, uh, in all the cases. You know, I think that the type is resisted in, in a way and negotiated, I mean, uh, but it's in, uh, interrogated, I can say. Uh, the stability uh, uh, of, of the stability of architecture form architecture forms is what gives the, the, our discipline this kind of history etc etc is resisted with this idea of a smooth transitions and always trying to to interrogate the moment or the instant or the change you know, that is present in, in your work in your recent work and and constraints are utilized in, in, in ways that are re resisting the negativeness of, 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 of uh, in that in principle they have. Are, or, and in the case of Philippe, that has been very um, transparent. I think he has been very transparent in the techniques he's using. But, uh, I think that language is, is, is reversed in, in many ways. I mean, this is a kind of very important tool. I mean, uh, you just go the opposite to what Duran said in the 19th century and you obtain a whole set of, of, of new principles. No? So I think this opposition to objectiveness is, is, is something that is we should think about or discuss. Okay. Um, <coughs> I, yeah, that, I don't know whether Mark meant it when he said that, that, that philosophers open things up and, and architects close things down. I don't know, because that, that what you're saying is, seems to be op opposite of that. Um, and it almost seems like it is that, I, I mean, I see almost to be an architect is to almost have, how do you define what an architect is? And it seems to me that it's almost like a gaze and you can architecturize anything. If you look at a glass of water, you can architecturize, it becomes a piece of architecture. And I think from that point of view, I mean, I would compare it to what theory itself is. Theory should be this open-minded process of interrogating things and it should never be a closed off set of, of precepts um, like Vitruvius. Uh, when I was teaching at the AA, I had to judge a competition for uh, the European Association of Architecture and Education. And I got all these essays coming in. Of course, when you're in the AA, you think the rest of the world's like the AA, but not at all. I, I got all these essays, um, and they were some like a combination of, um, of Vitruvius and the Ten Commandments. You know, it was like architecture should be this. It should be based on these ten principles. Um, um, they all came from Eastern Europe, strangely. Um, <laughs> And I think it's architecture is the opposite of that. It's a kind of fluid discipline about it, this, you know, um, where where it's absolutely not fixed, and it has its almost its identity, its lack of identity in some ways, as a kind of like this process of engagement with the outside world and interrogation of that world, um, which depends upon, draws upon those outside influences. Is that did I get you wrong there? <coughs> Let me add something to this. I, I think that the, is, is the, the, what they were saying it has a relationship with the fact that discourses are linear and they are produced in time. Um, design happens in an instant. I mean, it's, it's, it's completely mm, synchronic and not diachronic. And, and I think that this is why we can think that we are closing because there is a moment where you say, this is, and that's it. And, uh, while the discourse is a kind of beautiful melody that begins and makes a loop and another loop and then you <laughs> lands in a beautiful way. And, and you are always collecting a lot of, of data and trying to perform mm -hmm. objectively while you are feeling that you want to do something and you need to do this other thing that you have in the back of your brain from a long time ago, maybe a, a frustration from a competition you have lost or whatever, and then it catalyzes in a moment. Dropped. I think this is the, the kind of relationship that is. I don't know if I'm, uh, you can agree with this or not, but. Well, I, I think it's it's closing also because of uh, the question, in fact, that Carlos was, was asking, that we have to make a decision in the end. And in the end, it, it becomes a kind of frozen state, let's say, of, <laughs> of, of yeah, of that's it. Although the, the hope is, of course, that that state allows for possibilities that we cannot yet foresee. And, um, and I don't know, maybe just to return a little bit to, to your question as well in terms of how to begin um, and maybe why we've avoided a little bit of that uh, in our presentations is that it's, it's in some ways, it's, it's always different. You know, for each project, it's always different. And, but what maybe is the same, at least you know, from, from the way that we work, um, we have to find our own parameters, meaning we have to frame each project um, uh, in our own way. Uh, and, and in fact, that that kind of catalyst question is, is something that keeps being sort of asked or being reformed uh, during the process of the design. Um, so it's, it's in fact, it's not 
linear. It's not a, a kind of step-by-step -step decision making process, but it's really something that's quite messy in some ways. And um, and in that sense, maybe quite difficult in some ways also to categorize because in the end, I mean, uh, what I was saying before in terms of how we work in our office, it is kind of a survival of the fittest process in the sense that sometimes we have two or three parallel projects going at the same time for that one uh, competition. And at some point we kind of have to pull the plug, but but because, um, because we have these different things going on, we, we also test them against the different parameters and we find the one that actually let's say satisfies in some ways the most of uh, of what we had set out to to achieve but even even when you talk about the survival of the fitness actually that's kind of a process of assessment why yes. because you're the one who decides which one is the fitness Absolutely. so you have to make decisions once again and i think you said something very interesting which is has to do with um, precisely because you talked quite a lot about constraints in your presentation that some there can be some interest which could be some sort of probably some um, external constraints but then it's very important. There's there's a notion of the gaze of the architect, but also some something which is. But I don't I don't want to get mystical about that. But something about um, astuteness, almost. I don't know whether that's the right word in English, but being very um, astute, being very smart in choosing the right constraints for each project, mm -hmm. which could be different. Sometimes it might come from mm -hmm. uh, regulations. Sometimes it might come from other things. And I understand the way of working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But still, um, I, in in a non, uh, I. I'd like to disagree with Mark because I tend to agree with him all the time. So it's just like, no, I don't like this idea of um, architects as closers in terms of um, um, so precisely a thing in 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 my in my education, in my mind. I think that the most of the uh, works of architecture that I really that been more more important to me, I think there are projects that open up. It's almost projects that contain many projects in themselves, mm -hmm. and uh, whether they are built or unbuilt doesn't make a difference. Or whatever we, we've we've actually been. Uh, living off a few projects, I think that because they, they really open, um, even though they're not linear as would happen, I think the, mm -hmm. I think with architecture it's always um, a different type mm -hmm. of opener, but obviously in a different culture, mm -hmm. not that of the of the narrative. Anyway. Do you want to respond? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I, th I think uh, uh, one thing that I find very helpful tonight, I mean, also to quell the disappointment of is everyone showing, revealing the tricks, but I, I think one thing that was beneficial for me is actually, I think every all the presentations talked a little bit about their forefathers, you know? Yeah. Like uh, Camilo talked about the late arrival of Aldo Rossi yeah. in his life, before or after Homi Baba. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I think it's interesting. Maybe you don't, maybe it's a generation that doesn't have <coughs> the baggage of the late Rossi. You know, you see it with new eyes, you know, yeah. or, or, or Maison Domino, or, or, um, or, or Durand, or, or Guadet, you know? Like what, what the forefathers, I think for us, tells, us tell something about us, you know. I think if you ask us who are our forefathers, I, I probably would say between the two Aldos, between Aldo Van Eyck and Aldo Rossi, <laughs> somewhere uh, we would be happy if the work is situated there. And, and I think it's maybe if I have to go through a, 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 a analysis, maybe there are two moments where history was reintroduced into modern architecture at different moments, post-war and in the 60s. Yep. And, and both were introduced as moments, as, as things to open things up, I believe. Whether it's reacting to late modernism or the post-war situation of Team 10 or at the end of CM. You know? And I think, uh, but I'm just saying that, that no technique or no positions are, are forever opening or closing. You know? And I think this is something that one has to be aware of where we are at the moment. Sure. Yeah. I will, oh sorry, Sharon. No, please, please go. Um, well, I was just going to try to respond one to this this what seemingly was a this kind of oppositional nature between opening and closing, and maybe a observation that I saw might link a lot of the techniques, despite the differences of the specificity of them. Which, which was that I, I mean I think for not to speak free mark, but I think for us the inherent in all the work, which I think offsets this idea of closure or fixity, is that there's a kind of there always is a kind of resistance or oppositional quality. It's never a kind of pure model. So there, I think there's always a kind of condition of contrast. I saw that in your work, Jeanette, for example, in the Lausanne project, where you had the model for the core and the model for the, the, the envelope. Or I think, Camilo, you talked a lot about that in the later work, the kind of layering of projects, how you understand the kind of condition of resistance being something that's generative. And for Philippe, the idea of, I guess, the gradient becomes something that always establishes a relativity. It's never about a fixed a fix condition. 
And then, so I, I think that um, I think that's something that maybe unifies a lot of the approaches in a more general way and speaks, you know, not to an idea about having architecture close in in the literal sense, but about kind of what, what the framework we create to to, you know, I think resist closure, but actually in, engender a kind of intensity or a kind of active, active kind of atmosphere. Yep. I will like to try to answer your question, which is how does it begin? I think that when we get a commission or we get a phone call from a client that we have something that comes to the table. You get phone calls. I <laughs> no, <laughs> well, that's it's, that's that, that can be another a, topic or that we know that we are having a competition or something. I, I think that immediately, three different panoramas open up. One will be like, what interests us as an office to pursue, that we see that it belongs to the project itself, that it's within the program or within the commission. Something that we are able most of the times to twist around. Let's speak for example of a competition we just delivered, where 65% it's a parking spot, and uh, 45% it's 35% uh, is supposed to be offices, which means that it's 110,000 square meters. So they are building like 70 or 60 something thousand square uh, meters of parking lots. So we thought that everybody will try to solve the parking spot as solve the parking spot and put the effort on the other th on the other side, the easy side. So we try to find which one is the rough side that will bring us a possibility that perhaps by being a rough thing or a tough thing, maybe will give us an opportunity, a pitch different than others will do. So for example, in the case of this competition, we created that the that these huge floors of uh, uh, parking spots will be invaded by the offices through time. So in five, in two, five, ten years, as, as long as the um, public system is being built around, which, which is in the program right now, and it's going on with the, with the process of the city, then the owners will be able to rent more office spaces, right, and get rid of the parking spots. So that one belongs precisely to the core of the commission itself, what to do with uh, 60,000 square, square meters of uh, parking spots. Finding this way of getting out of it, of the, re of the frame as itself. But at the same time, while, while that happens, all this ghost file is always breathing, coming up and out, uh, being open and closed constantly because there is some information that you really need to translate into architecture. I'm full of gaps in my education. So I always see each project as a possibility to learn something that I didn't know before. And that, that implies taking a huge risk, which is do something that I have no experience. So it's very common that when we engage one of these competitions, the first thing we do is try to learn something that we don't know because it's, it's like amazing, it's this amazing thing of Paul Nakazawa's class that I'm visiting now, which is that at a certain point when you're a certain office, you only have projects, which means there's one of a kind. Then you move and you have clients, which is something that you constantly work for them. So in my case, I've only have projects. So each experience is co built only once. Uh, corporate center, this competition, I've never done one before. So that was my highest asset and my lowest asset in the competition. But I was able to twist the commission again. So each, each project that comes to the table immediately makes us aware that we need to learn something that we don't know because experience doesn't exist in a way. You don't, there was this little note at the fridge of the owner of the third house that we were there last week, which I think explains very well what I'm trying to say, which was that good experience come from bad judgment. And bad judgment, most of the times, come from good experiences. Something like, you, it, make it, it make you think about what's experience and what's judgment. And I think the way you frame the program or the way you frame the commission, first try to understand what it is and see how you can reframe it. I think it's a process of reframing. One of it is always by drawing, always by drawing. You cannot reframe a commission by reading, mainly. I mean, reading will become there as a matter to make things turn around or to see something or a possibility or a frame that takes place within the project. One is drawing. The other one is that each project has its own rules, pretty much what Jeanette mentioned. So sometimes it's very important to immediately do a model 
of a structure, for example, if you're dealing with housing, structure needs to appear very quick. But if you're dealing with a house, for example, structure perhaps is not that important. Perhaps it's more about the relations that will take place there, how we understand a, fam a family, or what's the aspirations of that family. So the tools are always attached to a way of thinking, to a way of uh, understanding a commission, and mainly to try to gain some experience that you don't have. So this comes like a loop that begins to fuel the system once again and again. So see. Okay, it's so tough to do this, but I think we should open to a couple of questions from the audience and as we wind down. If there are none, maybe. Um, well, you can blame Neil for this uh, question because we just had a lecture about deconstruction. Um, when uh, Mark, when you spoke about uh, approximation, it's sort of, um, I think it's a fascinating idea in a way every project is approximated because there's this point where we say stop, whether it's in the studio or in, in practice that we just have to stop and present it as the way it is. Um, but the way you approach it in a way is, I see it as very formalistic in a way, and I thought it was interesting that all the pictures that you showed were of the exteriors of your projects. In a way, and I think not to critique that, but to sort of compliment it, uh, we read uh, Derrida, and he is sort of speaking of the architectural act as an approximation towards something, as this carving of a path and I was thinking of how does a design technique just becomes a tool for the approximation of an experience? That is, how do we engage with the user of, a, of architecture? And we sort of provide an experience which is not, it's never going to be the full experience, but we let this possibility and then architecture truly becomes an open-ended act and sort of, I mean, the, the image that I had is that your buildings are in a way, your, your architecture is in a way, say Michelangelo's non finito. Um, and what I'm thinking about is sort of the pantheon in a way, that the sky is there, I'll never reach it, but the building sort of gives it to me. Um, <laughs> well, we, uh, we didn't show the interiors because they're all ruined by interior designers. <laughs> but, um, Well, I, th I think I think it's uh, our act is to provide the container for life. Huh? So, for us, the approximation of the architecture, we can approximate quite closely what the final result is. We can also approximate the life that happens within that container, but with a little bit more distance. Huh? Certainly, I mean, this is like very. Uh, I'm speaking of platitudes, but uh, there, there there are various degrees of this, the direction. If if I have to. Um, compare Herzog Damron's work with OMA's work. And I, I would think Herzog Damron's work always have something uh, quite iconic. Huh? You can remember the building right away. Less so with OMA for me. Uh, but probably the OMA buildings, when you walk through, you begin to uncover the maze inside. It's less imageable in the beginning for their building. And maybe it's uh, more uh, easy to imagine for Herzog Damron's building. What, what the I mean, this is very uh, a gross distinction, huh? and and I think different projects allow us to begin to to approximate different degrees of how close that, that experience or that life would be. And I don't know if if that that, that answers. I mean, it also I think it relates back into the whole issue of of boundaries and framing. I, I'm I, I saw I, I like Philip's uh, presentation very much, and I. And I think also relates to the, 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 the dissolving issue. Like at one point, I think the, when you show all the uh, the paintings uh, as an analogy, how it becomes much more pixelated and pointless. And but but I, I believe that there also is is the frame of the picture itself that is a incredibly hot boundary. But because of that frame, it allows all the dissolving of the boundaries that happen within. You know, so I, I, I'm interested in architecture as a precondition for the dissolution of boundaries. 
oftentimes, not just this illusion of boundaries itself, but you, you establish very strong boundaries, very definitive boundaries, so that openness could occur. Maybe that might be a better way of phrasing this opposition that I'm trying to. I think that's a great note to end on, actually. And thank you all. <laughs> I mean, it's a very definitive statement. And I like that. Um, thank you all. <clears throat> thank you all for being here, and please thank our guests. <laughs>